In the 18th century, there was a man named John Andre who was a major in the British Army and the head of its secret service in America during the American Revolutionary War. During Britain's war with the U.S., Andre was used by England to infiltrate the U.S. as a spy to help win the war for England. So when he arrived to America, Andre connected with a governor in Pennsylvania named Benedict Arnold. And maybe you might have heard about this in U.S. history class. And at the time, Benedict Arnold was becoming dissatisfied with his role as a U.S. soldier because he felt he wasn't getting the recognition he deserved while other generals were being promoted above him. So began Arnold's negotiations to sell out the U.S. to Britain. In 1780, John Andre was captured by American soldiers after they found papers in his shoes which explained how the British spy Andre came from a secret meeting with Benedict Arnold, who offered to surrender the Hudson River fort to the British Army for a bribe of 20,000 pounds. When Andre, or when Arnold, heard of this, he fled to England, becoming one of the greatest traitors in U.S. history. But meanwhile, General George Washington decided that Andre was to be hanged. Interestingly, this is where it truly gets interesting, several members of Washington's staff pleaded that Andre's life be spared because of his great character and because of his polite manners and all of his positive attributes. But Washington explained that if Andre had succeeded in his mission, America might have lost the war. The staff then supported Andre's request that he be shot like a soldier or an officer instead of hanged as a spy. And Washington also rejected this request, explaining that Andre, regardless of his personal attractiveness, was still a spy. And so Andre was hanged the next day. I tell this story because I think a lot of us have heard these stories about spies before, right? People who were sent to infiltrate the enemy territory in order to mess things up for them. Do you know that there are even spies in the spiritual world as well? Yes, the Bible tells us this many times that there are even those whom Satan plants in churches in order to destroy churches from inside. If Satan can't destroy a church from outside through persecution and death, he can certainly send these spies inside in order to bring about confusion and to distort their gospel message. And the interesting thing is a lot of these Christian spies are very attractive. They have really nice words. They're very winsome. But in reality, they're very dangerous to the church. And you know the sad thing is, a lot of churches actually accept these false teachers because they think, oh, it's okay, we're doing it all in the name of love and tolerance and acceptance. And it seems like a lot of professing Christians are okay with it. But Jesus sees this corruption and he says he will judge it unless the church turns from their wicked ways, which is what Jesus is going to talk about in today's passage in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. So that's where you need to be in your Bibles. And like I said, we got plenty of Bibles back there in the back. So, so we are going through the book of Revelation, which, like I said, talks about the end times. So these are letters that were written to seven churches to tell them about what Jesus likes about these churches, but also what he does not like about these churches. And these are issues that churches will pretty much deal with for all times until the church age is over. So that's why it's relevant to us today as it was back then. So last week, Jesus addresses the church in Pergamum to show them that their sin is that they have compromised with worldliness and falsehood. So it tells us about the danger of becoming a compromising church. Now this week, Jesus is going to move on to another church in Thyatira, in which he talks about things he likes about this church, but also something that he sees that's very gravely ill with this church. 
which is pretty much the same corruption, but it's on a leadership level, which is really bad. So basically, he's telling us that this is a corrupt church that comes from corrupt leadership. And that's the main point of today's passage. So Jesus today will give us his three analytical views of the Thyatiran church to warn us about the danger of becoming a corrupt church. Very simple, right? Okay, so first, Jesus expresses his first view through his point number one, commendation of the church. We see that in verses 18 to 19. What does Jesus like about the church? And thankfully, there are some good things to say about this church. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at verses 18 and 19, folks. So in verse 18, he begins and says this, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. Okay, before we move any further, I just want to say, this is the longest letter of, of any of the seven churches that he addresses. So he has quite a bit of things to say to this church. And if you guys don't know anything about Thyatira, I'll just kind of explain a little bit. So Thyatira apparently was founded by one of Alexander the Great's successors named Seleucus. So Thyatira was a big growing commercial center and it was really known for its many labor unions, which a lot of the townspeople were a part of. So Jesus has a very important message for them. First of all, he says that he is the son of God. You see, he's identifying his deity, but also he's identifying himself as the judge. You see here, he says that there is no secret sin that is hidden from his eyes. He sees all things even in the church, so he is ready to call out. So in verse 19, let's see how he begins his analysis of this church. He says, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Okay. It seems that Jesus likes six things about this particular church. It's pretty easy. He likes their deeds, which is they have good works. He likes their love, which the Ephesian church was apparently missing. He likes the fact that they have faith, which is very important. Don't you guys agree? Yep. And he also likes the fact that they are persevering, meaning they are enduring even in hard times, even when ministry is very difficult with all the persecution. You see, the Apostle Paul even commends the Thessalonian church for pretty much the same thing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, I'll read it really quickly. Look at what Paul says. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as it is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Yes, and remember, the Thessalonian church was really one of the most beloved churches in the New Testament era. But then look at this. Jesus also points out this about this church. He says, I love the fact that your deeds of latter were greater than the first. You know what that means? He's basically saying, I love the fact that you guys improved as a church. So when you first started, you guys were doing okay, but then you, you sought to do better over time instead of just staying stagnant. Don't you think that's a great thing? I mean, isn't it great when anybody tries to do better than they were in the beginning? Like I remember years ago, I watched this documentary called Jiro Dreams of Sushi, which talks about the greatest sushi chef apparently in Japan, who makes like the most purest sushi and everybody raves about, you know, Michelin star and everybody. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that you'll see about his philosophy, even though he pretty much has got this recipe down from day one, he says that his passion every day, and he even thinks about it, is finding ways to make his sushi better and better and better and better. Wow. I mean, don't you think there's something really admirable about that? I mean, could you imagine if church leaders and church members wanted to do the same thing for Jesus too? 
mean, wouldn't that be great? We would have such a powerful church. So the whole lesson behind point number one is this. Jesus remembers all the good things we do, such as, I'm going to say it again, deeds, love, faith, perseverance, and improving. So continue on with these things and don't give up. That's what Jesus is saying. But then there's one thing Jesus saw about this church that was very dangerous. And we have to pay attention to this part because I'm telling you, a lot of churches even these days fall into this trap. So Jesus expresses his second view through his point number two, criticism of the church. So now he's going to lay down the criticism in verses 20 to 23. So let's look at it together. So in verse 20, he says, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Well, Jezebel was probably not her real name, but a nickname given to her by the Lord. Do we guys remember Jezebel from the Old Testament? Kind of. Do we need a refresher? Okay, let's do a little refresher. So in 1 Kings, Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab, who was one of the most wicked kings of Israel. And she was pretty much the mastermind behind his rule. So Jezebel influenced her husband and used her royal position to promote Baal worship amongst Israel. She killed God's prophets and instituted her own Baal priests. So she led Israel astray into idolatry, which is why she was really one of the most dangerous spiritual figures in Israel in the Old Testament. So in the same way, this Jezebel lady in the Thyatiran church misled God's people into idol worship and into sexual immorality. Wow, that's crazy, right? Now, we don't really know what her exact position in the church is, but apparently she had some sort of a teaching platform to tell people it's okay to be a Christian, but then live licentiously. If you don't know what that word means, that pretty much means you can just live however way you want, just like the pagans, just like the unbelievers. Just go for it. Whew. Okay. Well, we don't really know exactly what she did, but there was a theory that she encouraged churchgoers to attend those guilds' pagan meals that honored their mascot deities and pretty much participated in all the cultic sexual rituals there. And you know the crazy thing is that the church, they didn't discipline her, they didn't warn her, they didn't remove her, but allowed her to continue with her bad influence. Now, like I said, it's one thing for you to personally fall into sin, but it's quite another when you lead another person into sin through your example and through your teaching. That's a very heinous sin before the Lord God. I heard a story many years ago in London how musicians saw these errand boys all whistled out of tune as they went about their work. Someone suggested it was because the bells of Westminster were slightly out of tune. So something had gone wrong with the chimes. The boys did not know that there was anything wrong with the tune and quite simply just copied the tune. So in the same way, we tend to copy the ways of those whom we associate with or those whom we are under. This is the reason why church leadership integrity is so important because we set an example for other people to follow. So when you guys go to churches in the future, this is one of the things you need to look for in the pastor and the eldership team. So back then it was these issues, but today it could be many things. Like for example, it could be pastors who tell people it's okay to live with people before you're married or to sleep around with them. It's okay to support homosexuality or transgenderism. It's okay to go to those gay pride parades. It's okay to support abortion. In fact, it's okay to even curse and swear just like everybody else. You know, a lot of things that we see in liberal churches these days. It's pretty horrific. So what does Jesus say about this? In verse 21, he says, I gave her time to repent 
and she does not want to repent of her immorality. You see, Jesus is so merciful that even with these false teachers, he still gives them time to repent and get right. Even though he could have struck them down. But look what happens here. It says, she did not want to repent of her immorality. So verse 22, behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. So Jesus is basically saying, because she didn't repent, the same bed of immorality that she led so many people to, I am going to put her in as well. She's going to suffer sickness and she will die. And not just that, he doesn't just stop with her. He also says the people who went along with her, who participated with her, will also experience the discipline of God. Wow, this is making my heart pump when I, when I read this. So this just shows that sometimes the Lord will do this. Even today, at times he will do this in order to preserve the purity of the church because the bride of Christ means so much to him. So the whole lesson behind this is pretty simple. He values doctrinal integrity as well as pure practices in the church, especially amongst the leaders. So this is something that I want to encourage you guys. Even if you're not going to go into ministry as a pastor or some important position, remember that these are sins that we can personally struggle with too. So we need to watch out that we don't call ourselves Christian, but at the same time have that spirit of Jezebel within us to think we can just go along with the world. But then... Jesus will express his last analytical view of the church in point number three. So he's going to give his command to the church, his final command to the church. We see that in verses 24 to 29. So let's look at it together, church. So in verse 24, he says, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Oh, the good thing about this church is they actually had some faithful people inside. In 1 Kings, even though Jezebel instituted Baal worship and almost everyone just went along with the flow, there were about 7,000 Israelites who did not bow to Baal. And in this church, we had faithful members who did not bow to the ways of Jezebel. They were convicted of the word of God and they acted upon it. So Jesus says to them, good job. I don't want to burden you anymore. Just continue on this path all the way at the, to the end. And then this is the reward. See, he always ends with the reward because this is really what should inspire us when we feel like giving up. In verses 26 to 27, he says, He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. So anytime one of these letters ends to the church, he talks about the overcomer. It's pretty simple. The overcomer is the Christian, those who have placed their faith in Jesus and those who are being moved by the Spirit to do all these godly things. He says, your reward is that you are going to rule alongside Christ in his coming kingdom. And we know this is going to happen. Because in the Old Testament, it talked about that so many times. In fact, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 10, after Jesus returns at his second coming, he sets up this kingdom that lasts for a thousand years, and he needs people to minister all around the world, right? And that's obviously going to be us. So that's why, you know, we have something great to be looking forward to in the future. It's not just getting a ticket and going to heaven, but just all the benefits that come along with it. The program of the coming kingdom. That's awesome. You see, in Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, this is when the Lord was speaking about Jesus' his son. 
He says, I surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Isn't that what Jesus just said in this passage? Mm Mm-hmm. He's the fulfillment of it. This is so awesome. So in verses 20 to 29, he ends with this. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So basically, Jesus is saying, if you hear my message, take these words seriously. So yes, listen to both how I commend the church, but then how I criticize the church. You really need to pay attention because these are issues that we will struggle with even now today. So in conclusion, in summation, once again, Jesus' commendation, his criticism, as well as command to the Thyatirian church, all shows us what Jesus loves about a church, but then also what he hates about a church. And we can't ignore that. So I want to challenge you with this in closing. So I know that we can walk away from here and just think that uh, this is just a message about corrupt pastors, whether they be male or female. No, it's not just directed towards them. Of course, we do need to pay attention to that so that we know who to keep in office, obviously. But look at your own hearts to see if this is something that's true of yourself as well. Because I'm telling you, there are so many people out there who profess to be Christian, but yet the spirit of Jezebel was within them. That they are practicing sin, that they are telling other people it's okay to live like this, to believe this, all of these things that are so unbiblical. If that's you here today, then Jesus says that you need to repent today. You need to turn from your sin and you need to turn to Christ because he offers you eternal life because of what he did on the cross. That offers for everybody in the world. But he says in order to receive that gift, you need to repent and you need to trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior and you will be saved. And not just that, but you will be given a new heart, a new spirit so that you can obey the Lord and love the Lord. But then I also want to encourage you with this, Christians, brothers and sisters, we need to persevere in doing good because like I said, this is really a problem that happens in churches and that can happen in our life too. So one of the things we really need to watch out for is sin in the church because if it goes unaddressed, it will destroy the church. And he's telling us, don't let that happen, no matter where you're at. Father, we thank you for this message. That is really a serious reminder of things that can go wrong in a church. For even though there are so many good things happening in that church, but yet there's a cancer that's growing in there, that in this case, we see how these false leaders are misleading the people into sin. And you say that that is really a horrible thing. So we pray, Lord, that if we are guilty of being a hypocrite, if we ourselves are practicing unrepentant sin and maybe even encouraging and leading other people into that same sin, then we want to confess before you and ask that you'll forgive us and that you will please set our character right so that instead of being a Thyatiran church, we can be one of the churches in the Bible that you had only good things to say about. But until the day we go to be with you, we recognize that there are so many temptations and worldliness, we want to be on guard. So we pray, Lord, that you'll give us strength so that we can run the race and that we may rule alongside of you when you return and set up your kingdom in Israel and that your law will go forth from Zion to all the nations. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.